And it's um, over to Dr. Keston Perry now. Um, Keston, I give you uh, the Zoom space. <laughs> Thank you very much, Goldie. And I am actually quite pleased to be here um, to join you from my flat in London. So <laughs> and I'm happy to sort of share some ideas, which is part of um, an ongoing project around climate justice and reparations and trying to find, I suppose, some theoretical space to discuss issues around reparations that are directly linked to processes of enslavement, of uh, colonialism, and the current period of, of climate my own sort of theoretical uh, background is the idea of, of, of political economy of development in the Caribbean region as one of the regions that have been one sort of most exploited with respect to uh, colonialism, but also a region that is, um, I think, um, you know, very recent discourses and discussions around capitalism tend to look in other spaces. So probably the African continent tend to look far east, um, the, the, you know, the the intellectual but also material edifice of capitalism started in sort of uh, inflict that you know dispossession but also inflict exploitation and continued exploitation over a period of more than 500 years so that is where i come from um i suppose intellectually and i think climate reparations is, is not only um a philosophical idea but in my view it is a very much a material and a, a you know policy approach to understanding these kinds of intersecting challenges that are faced um, in the region, in the Caribbean region, but I suppose globally as well in the global south. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you some data and share with you, you know, some of what, you know, some of the economic data around losses and damage and what, what is happening in terms of climate related disasters at a global level how the Caribbean region fits into that and other low-income countries as well. And I'm going to share as well how our current resources, even in the context of global neoliberalism, how those resources are being divided up and, and, and how ideas around climate finance is being conceptualized as a neoliberal tool to one, continue that process of exploitation, but also to extract surplus from the global south. Um, it's often sort of depicted as the idea that, you know, we need finance to invest, to address the issues of climate change. But in my view, it's actually the opposite. Um, and I'm going to link this to the process of colonialism and, and show the long lines of, of connection and linkages between colonialism and the current climate crisis that we're facing. And bring up as a, um, you know, especially Caribbean region uh, has and, and is often, you know, depicted as middle income countries. And so they're, they're often closed off from certain kinds of compensatory mechanisms at a global scale. You know, why climate reparations is important in that regard. I'm going to give you a brief about that, and then I'm going to end. 
so to give you an idea of the sort of geographies of disaster and the geographies of uh, loss and damage with respect to the climate crisis, we can look at this map that shows us in 2019 the, where those disasters, the majority of disasters have happened. And I want to zone in on two areas. So I want to zone in on the Southeastern African region where we had uh, cyclones Idai and Kenneth in 2019 that affected uh, several countries in, in that region. So we had Malawi, Malawi uh, Mozambique, logics that suit certain kinds of um uh you know powerful forces the the you know losses and damage are calculated according to certain kinds of methodologies but for for, for the purpose of this talk i'm going to utilize at face value these these particular figures so overall losses within that region as a result of these cyclones were about 2.3 billion dollars i think this has increased since then in terms of the estimates and the fatalities that resulted as a result of those uh, cyclones um, were over a thousand uh, people died as a result of, of cyclone Edai. In the Caribbean region, we had in 2019 Hurricane Dorian, and we see a number of countries, although overall, if we consider both the Anglophone Caribbean as well as the, you know, um, uh, Lat, you know, Spanish-speaking Caribbean, it makes up about 40 million people. The, the Anglophone Caribbean is just about, uh, you know, 9 million people. And the Hurricane Dorian in 2019, you know, rested upon uh, the Bahamas and spent over 40 hours, a, a Category 5 hurricane, affecting you know, the Abaco Islands in the Bahamas, but also Grand Bahama, which are two major islands for tourism and other kinds of, of uh, economic activity in the Bahamas. And it, it amounted to losses throughout the region. Um, the Bahamas was most, were most affected throughout the region for about $5.6 billion. And of those losses, the insurable amount according to, to this, this database, it's only about $4 billion. So over $1 billion uh, is uninsurable, um, according to, to, to the, these data. Um, are you seeing the slides? Yes, we are. Okay, great. So I was pointing out here that from, you know, over the 20-year period from 1998 to 2017, the UN estimated that the majority of disasters were attributed to uh, climate change. And, you know, this included a number of different kinds of hydrological and, and climatological disasters, like floods, storms, in addition to wildfires and droughts. And overall, the cost of, of those climate-related disasters were over $2 billion um, over that period of time. You know, in terms of the Caribbean region, which is my, my focus, uh, the World Bank in 2016 averaged that the region on a yearly basis loses over 835 million US dollars. And this is a region, as I mentioned, of uh, 9 million people if we consider the, only the Anglophone Caribbean region. Uh, countries like Haiti, for instance, uh, the worst hit in 2017, Haiti was uh, considered by the Global Climate Risk Index. It was considered the most uh, disaster-prone country with respect to uh, climate change. We cannot consider um, these kinds of effects in terms of climate change without considering the history that countries like Haiti have uh, experienced in terms of colonialism, in terms of 
the kinds of economic exploitation, but also in terms of current forms of, of, of dispossession with respect to corporate, um, corporate uh, forces uh, and, and control of, of material resources like minerals and so on which countries like, you know, across the region have been uh, historically uh, subject to. So this also gives a very interesting picture. So this was the United Nations Human Costs Report that pointed out of the 10 top countries with respect to economic losses as a percent of GDP over 2000 to 2019, actually, the nine of those countries reside in the Caribbean region. This is from a global perspective. In terms of economic losses um, with respect to climate change. So, I mean, it, it is absolutely astounding as a region that is small in terms of its um, population size, in terms of its topography and so on, have been, uh, you know, subject to major economic losses over this period of time. And again, as I started, this is not a, an, an, a, an accident of history. This is as a part of a long process that is, that is linked to the Caribbean region being the center of global capitalism and being the region from which Great Britain, France, the Netherlands, and so on, extracted capital and resources, but also tra transported uh, African people, you know, to, to create plantation systems and, 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 and from which capitalism and, and industrial capitalism was birthed in Europe. So if we look at some of the data again over the 1980 to 2018, we can see on many of those uh, events were both meteorological events like tropical storms, hurricanes, and so on. This is the green bar at the bottom or the second bar here from the bottom. And then the, those kinds of events, hydrological events like floods, you know, store um, mass movements of, of, of land and, and displacement of land and so on. We've seen those events over time increase dramatically from the 1980s to um, current period. Again, in terms of climate related disasters and in terms of what is insurable, um, based on uh, what is, you know, the Caribbean region has a Caribbean regional insurance scheme, which countries all pool resources to be able to respond and, and access resources um, to respond to major environmental disasters and events. And the majority in terms of overall losses compared to what, what, is, what are insurable losses, again, there's a major gap between what is insured and what, what, what is not insured from these disasters. And we can see this gap actually increasing over time. Um, and so the losses are actually met both by, um, both by Caribbean governments, um, which are highly indebted um, countries, and you know, by the populations themselves in terms of building back, in terms of recovery and relief uh, resources that are needed um, as a result of these kinds of events. Again, we can see the kinds of events over time have increased, and this is directly related to the process of, 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 of um, the climate crisis. And the, we can see also here, um, in terms of the light, the dark, the light blue um, bar, those kinds of events, even if we consider the proportion of the Caribbean region as, as relatively small in population size, the Caribbean region again is disaster prone and have become made vulnerable as a result of the kinds of processes I've, I've talked about. Over time, again, the majority of those kinds of storms events are also have also occurred in the Caribbean region. Um, only surpassed in some cases by uh, the South American region. 
In 2019, climate-related disasters, the majority of which happened in the global south. I mentioned earlier, as a result of Cyclone Idai in 2019, Mozambique, Malawi, uh, Zimbabwe, and so on, these countries experienced the largest number of deaths and fatalities as a result of climate change, followed by South Asia. Uh, and Brazil, as well as, as China. So how do we link the idea of, the, uh, to col of colonialism and 500 years of exploitation to the climate crisis? And this is very critical for us to understand the kinds of differential effects that the Caribbean region is facing and other global South countries is facing, are facing. And, you know, this process that we have often heard talked about as some kind of natural process, uh, some kind of, of um, something related to, to um, human beings impact on, on, on the environment and so on. We can see that the levels of inequity that are faced with this and the differential exposure of countries in the Caribbean region and global South countries can be related to the kinds of uh, effects of exploitation as a result of colonialism. Uh, you know, in fact, when you, when you create plantation societies that are monocrop societies, you decimate uh, the kinds of indigenous practices of revitalizing the environment. You, you create um, very... You know, you Apologies for that. I've, I've just muted that person. Sorry, carry on. Can That's okay. You create, um, as a monocrop culture, you, you, the, the kinds of products that were, 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 that were produced in the Caribbean region, coffee, cocoa, sugar cane, those kinds of products were created and, and were produced in order to satisfy the demand for those products in, 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 in Europe and satisfy the, the, um, the, the producing class or the planter class to create profits from exploited labor and racialized labor of, of, African, of African peoples and, and indentured labor from India and, 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 and so on. So this process led to not material impacts that have worsened both environmental practices, have disabled institutions and institutional capacity to respond to these kinds of major events. But also, we, we, we need to understand the colonial economy or the, the colonial process as not disconnected from the post-colonial economic relations as uh, Bramber has, has suggested. So there wasn't a major rupture from that colonial period onto the current period as a result of which the exposure towards two major uh, climate-related events have worsened those kinds of, of inequalities in the region. We've also seen, you know, throughout this period, um, a continuation of activities, um, outflows of income in terms of surplus, in terms of material wealth, through the, the practices of, of transnational corporations, for instance, through certain kinds of land use practices and, and that have continued from the colonial period to the present, but also the infrastructures that have been built in many of, 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 of the Caribbean uh, countries. We can think about in 2017, when Barbuda was hit by Hurricane Maria and the entire Barbuda or majority, 90% of Barbudan um, uh, households and homes and infrastructure were damaged that caused major disruption to that country and has also um, contributed to um, so forms of dispossession which are actually being perpetrated currently by the, Bar by the Antiguan and Barbudan government in order to give land to billionaires and, and, and many um, investors, quote unquote, from the global north. So we, we also can link uh, 
as I've shown, the link is, 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 is apparent if we consider both the, the, the physical evidence of in terms of land use practices, in terms of the resource depletion of, of, of resources, uh, forest deforestation is a major part of, of the Haitian um, reality and so on. And, and in addition to agricultural practices and, and so on that started again in the plantation economy uh, uh, during that, that period of colonialism. And we're seeing more and more evidence pointing to how these kinds of practices that began during the colonial period have continued and have actually led to the destabilizing uh, you know, hum human civilization on one level, but also destabilizing the environment in the Caribbean region, in the Indian Ocean, and so on. So I wanted to show this particular table for us to get an idea that, you know, if we consider the post-colonial period compared to the colonial period, the post-colonial period is way much shorter and significantly shorter than the period under which many of these countries, which are considered the most vulnerable to climate change, have um, existed. So if we can take the, the example of Bangladesh, which had, uh, which was a British colony that had um, endured colonialism for over 250 years almost. It is considered one of the countries that is, that, that is most vulnerable to climate change according to the Notre Dame Adaptation Index, which is an index used to measure countries' ability to respond to different kinds of environmental events and, and major um, extreme weather events. Um, and you know, during the period of 1997 to 2016, Bangladesh suffered, according to this, um, to this, um, the Global Climate Risk Index, suffered the most uh, in terms of losses, over two billion dollars. Followed by by island communities like the Fiji Islands, which were all which were also uh, British, um, which were also under British rule. Grenada has also during this period in 2004, had a major um, uh, hurricane in Hurricane Ivan, and the majority of its, its, its GDP w was wiped out. Um, Haiti um, has been one of the most exposed countries in the entire world, and as part of the Caribbean region, was also subject to that, that period of colonialism from, from the French. In fact, Haiti had to pay in order, had to pay France in order for its uh, independence to be recognized after the Haitian Revolution um, in 1804. So, you know, these countries continue to be exposed, continue to um, have, you know, continue to be, you know, vulnerable and exposed to climate change, and their vulnerability can be linked again to. Uh, the processes of, of enslavement and, in some cases, in the process of colonialism. So we can, we can think about how do we measure the responsibility to climate change and how do we think about who is most responsible to climate change. And this graph shows us here the yellow, the yellow area of the graph shows us the EU28, which is now EU27, uh, historically from the 18th century to the current period. As we know, carbon emissions are the most responsible for global warming that have led to, uh, you know, the increase in, in uh, types of disasters, the, the um, major warming of the Atlantic Ocean that contributes to hurricanes and the frequency of hurricanes we've seen in, two, in, in 2020, there were 30 hurricanes or 30 storms, sorry, and a number of hurricanes were formed in the Atlantic Ocean that have affected a number of, 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 of countries in the region and in Central America. So the, we can see the European Union countries, 
are responsible in this case for about 22% of, of uh, historical carbon emissions. And during this period, again, many of these countries, many of the countries in the Caribbean region were colonies. Uh, many of them, I mean, Barbuda only received its independence in 1981, followed by the North American United States, which has contributed actually the majority of, of, of carbon emissions at 25% from the 18th century to the current period. China only overtook, um, and China is often sort of uh, scapegoated as the country that currently has, you know, contributes the most greenhouse gas emissions, but China only overtook the United States in 2005. If we consider climate change as a long process and as a, as a, a uh, violent process that has happened over a long period of time that started over a long period of time, we need to consider colonial powers and imperial powers in particular United States and many European countries have been responsible for almost 50% of greenhouse gas emissions historically. Similarly, this shows um, if we look in terms of cumulative uh, carbon emissions, the United States, the darker red regions are the countries that have contributed the most um, from fossil fuels dating back to the 18th century. So the United States, um, this region here has, you know, it's very dark red and contributed a large portion uh, or the majority of, of, of historical emissions. Then we can see uh, regions here, um, Russia and China and so on, contributing uh, following the United States. If we look currently um, compared to historical uh, emissions. In terms of addressing the problem, um, so since 2010, there have been major discussions around climate finance at the United Nations Framework on Climate Change. And countries at that point in time uh, pledged to contribute uh, you know, up to $100 billion to the effort of addressing um, climate change. If we look at how those, those funds have been divided, um, we can see here in terms of funding towards activities that would support the most vulnerable countries adapt to climate change, it has received least amount of funds. So if we look at the, 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 the very top of, of this particular graph here, only $30 billion in 2017, 2018 have been uh, you know, allocated towards adaptation activities in those countries. You know, mitigation activities, which are activities towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which are sort of longer term type activities and which affect perhaps um, advanced or which affect global north countries the most, have received the majority of funding in, in this period. So over $537 billion have been allocated towards those kinds of activities like renewable energy, energy efficiency activities, low, co low carbon transportation, and so on, that address reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. As we can see here, there's, there's actually no line item that is currently um, you know, allocated at an international level towards compensating countries for the losses that they already face with respect to, to climate change and, and with respect to the fallout of climate change. Again, I've pointed out the countries that are most vulnerable have also been former colonies, but also low-income countries. And in some cases, countries that are uh, closed off from receiving concessional finance through development aid and so on, as in the case of many of the Caribbean countries. So we can also consider a, a few specific examples um, with respect to losses and damage that countries face and, and to, to get an idea of the, the extent and the magnitude of the problem that these um, countries have, uh, are facing. So I, I mentioned in, in 2020, over 30 storms were developed in the Atlantic hurricane season, 
uh, two major storms were Hurricane Ita and Iota that affected a, a number of Caribbean countries, but especially Central American countries, and caused over two, 400 deaths in, in only the Atlantic period from June uh, 2020 to November of 2020. In 2017, I mentioned this was the most devastating year thus far in terms of costs of towards um, as a result of climate change in the Caribbean region. Uh, Dominica's total loss and damage from Hurricane Maria were estimated at over $1.3 billion. The majority of the, that funding have not been met by any current sources um, of international funding or support towards um, Dominica or towards compensating Dominica for those losses. The Bahamas again experienced losses over $3 billion that have contributed now to an, an increase in public debt of over $565 million as a result of Hurricane Dorian. Again, these countries are not the ones have been responsible for emitting greenhouse gases or carbon emissions, but on the other side, they are facing the most um, dev devastating effects as a result. And in addition to which, given the current um, configuration of the global economy and the fact that they're not being compensated, they're actually having to increase their debt levels, their public debt levels, in order to um, conduct recovery and relief activities so that people can you know, return to some form of, of normalcy or, 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 you know, try to have some kind of, of life after these major events. Um, I mentioned again Mozambique uh, and, uh, and Cyclone Sidai and, and Kenneth, which have also contributed in the case of West, South, Southwestern Africa, um, major losses in 2019. So to, to bridge the gap in terms of justice um, and in terms of addressing the historical wrongs um, with respect to climate change that again are linked to very long processes of enslavement, colonialism, and differential exposure of people of African descent, differential exposure of people of indigenous heritage, we need to consider a new mechanism and we need to consider this in a sort of global, from a global perspective of countries, states on the one level that have been former, col former colonial powers, but also major capitalist countries like in Europe and in the United States and North America, as well as on the other level of corporations funding compensation and meeting the compensation for loss and damage that these countries, that are visited upon these countries as a result of um, climate related events. And climate reparations is my view, is one mechanism for addressing the, the gap in terms of justice, but also in terms of uh, historical um, wrongs that have, have these countries and, and populations face. So climate reparations, in my view, is you can put a monetary value to it, right? Um, but I, I think it goes beyond mon money and finances. And we have to consider the kinds of devastation in terms of non-economic losses, in terms of health, in terms of traumatic events, um, as a result of major storms that are visited upon countries, the kinds of economic displacement that, that um, people face, um, displacement in terms of the migration that, that result from climate, from climate episodes, um, but are also linked to these historical processes of exploitation, extraction of resources, depletion of natural resources, um, the monoculture um, economies, um, that also have these kinds of socio-economic uh, effects, sorry, as well as ecological effects. Um, the environmental harm that, that face these communities as well. In my view, it has to be part of a, a broader system of reparations. Again, um, the Caribbean region have, have formed uh, uh, 
uh, a reparations uh, framework for discussing reparations. I think in addition to that framework, which I, which I consider uh, economic reparations in terms of the, the, the Caribbean CARICOM effort, we have to consider climate reparations as a separate category to address uh, the fallout from climate change. Again, to conclude, we can think about climate crisis not being, it, we kind of think of it in terms of only a sort of natural event occurring as a result of human uh, intervention or, or, or man-made impacts. We have to think about it in terms of the inequalities that uh, arise as a result of the effects of climate change that are linked to long-term historical processes. The, you know, the economic costs that are being faced by countries are unevenly distributed between countries that have been former colonies in the Caribbean region we can think about, and those countries um, that are now sort of major global economic powers like in Western Europe and the United States. And climate reparations in my view are one mechanism to remedy the wrongs, but also have to be built upon reimagining um, the international economic order. It has to be about, you know, the kinds of redistribution of wealth back to those countries that face the fallout of, of climate change disproportionately. And it, it, we can only sort of try to have this, this conversation about actually realizing climate reparations by reinvigorating a sort of internationalism and international solidarity that we, you know, the, the world um, has not seen for a, couple, a generation or so since the 1970s that we can think about. You know, it, it cannot be only based on um, idea around green recoveries and, and neoliberal ideas about green, um, green economies and, you know, uh, invigorating um, renewable technologies. All of that is probably part of, 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 of the, 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 the kinds of interventions that we need, but it has to be ethically centered and justice centered in order to meet the, the demands um, and the devastation that these countries face today. Thank you very much, and I'm going to end there.